Some video games use cutscenes to give the player a break from a frenetic level. Others use dialogue sequences to let the player decide how and when to digest the world's lore. And others base the whole experience solely on conversations with skill checks. The dialogue module allows you to very easily create interactive dialogue sequences and cutscenes. To create a new conversation, simply add the dialogue component onto any game object. This component is composed of four sections. The toolbar is where you can choose whether to create a new text line, a random pick, or make a choice. You can also choose whether to create a new node below as a sibling of the currently selected node or as a child. On the right side, you can see two buttons that toggle the settings and the inspector sidebars. The settings sidebar contains the skin, actors, and editor preferences. The dialogue skin is an asset that defines the visual aspect of the user interface. The module comes with a collection of different skins to choose from. To install them, click on the top toolbar and select Game Creator and Install. The options marked with this icon are skins and you just need to select them and click on the install button. After doing so, you'll be able to pick them from the dialog skin field on any dialog module. To learn more about how to create a custom skin, check the link down in the description. The inspector sidebar is where each line is configured after selecting it from the outline panel. The outline panel is in the middle of the component and is where you can read and follow the conversation from top to bottom. Let's see how we can create a very simple conversation. We can click on the first toolbar button to create a new text node. Once selected, we can see its settings on the right side. At the top, we can see the type of node we've created. If we want to change it, we can do so by clicking on the button and selecting the new type from the drop-down menu. The conditions list below determines whether or not this dialogue line can run. We'll see later on how this can be effectively used to organize the flow of a conversation. The portrait drop-down allows you to pick which portrait location to use. The actor field lets you choose an existing actor asset. Actors define multiple traits of a character, so you can more easily use them in any conversation. To create a new actor asset, right-click on any folder from the project panel and select Create, Game Creator, Dialog, Actor. An actor has optional name and description fields at the very top. We'll give our actor the name Henry and leave the description blank. There's an expression list below, which allows you to configure any amount of different moods and emotions. We can create more expressions by clicking on Add Expression and configuring its values. Every expression must have a unique ID, which is used to identify this expression, among others. The sprite is the image displayed on screen, if any at all, when the actor delivers a line. The on start and on end instructions are executed when the expression starts playing and when it stops. This is the perfect place to instantiate an automatopoeia, start and stop states, or play any particle effects. A bit further down, there's a section called typewriter effect. This section allows you to set whether the text delivered should be delivered all at once or show the text character by character at the specified pace. The gibberish field also allows playing a repeating sound effect while the typewriting effect plays. And finally, the optional skin field lets you override the default skin for this particular actor. Back to the dialogues inspector, we can see that if we drag and drop the new actor asset, a new field appears right below, which lets us choose an expression. The dialog component automatically scans the conversation hierarchy and makes note of which actors are being used. If we expand the settings sidebar, we can see how the actor we just used appears on the left side and lets us bind a scene object with this particular actor. In our case, 
we'll bind it to the character from the scene. The text field is where you set the content delivered by this line. For example, let's say we want our character to say, Hello, my name is Henry. We can type this text inside the corresponding field, and when running this dialog, it will deliver this text line. However, this phrase is a bit static. What if later on, we decide that Henry is no longer called that, but instead he's Jonathan? What if we want to display a name chosen by the player? Or a skill check value? Or the amount of boars left to kill from a quest? That's where dynamic values come into play. Right below the text field, there's a button that allows adding a new dynamic value. Clicking it creates a new entry with a value that will replace the character's name. In our case, we'll simply use a simple text with the value Jonathan, but this value could come from any source, including stats, quests, variables, or even inventory items, if these modules are installed. In order to use a dynamic value, we simply replace Henry's name with a pair of brackets and the index of the value in the list. If we click play and run this dialog, we'll see how the character says, Hello, my name is Jonathan. Creating dynamic values for each dialog line can become a bit tedious. That's why the dialog module also comes with global dynamic values. These work very similarly but you don't need to set them up every time you need to use them. To create a new global dynamic value, open the Game Creator Settings window, select the Dialog tab, and create a new entry in the list. This list looks exactly the same as the previous one, except that it has a key field at the very top. This key is a custom ID that will be searched and replaced. For example, we can use the key friend name and give it the value Alice. Now, let's go back to the dialog and change the text field to also include the global dynamic value by adding the sentence, and my friend is, and between brackets, the friend name key. If we go again into play mode, we can see how the text displayed is, hello, my name is Jonathan, and my friend is Alice. The audio field allows playing an audio clip. It's important to note that this audio clip is a voiceover, and thus it goes through the speech channel. The animation field below hides an incredible feature. Let's drag and drop this animation I have here and see how an animation sequencing tool appears right below. This tool allows you to preview the animation onto the currently selected actor scene object by scrubbing through the timeline. We can also create instructions that are executed at any point by moving the head and clicking on the plus button. This creates a marker that can be moved around. Selecting it reveals an instructions list that is executed when the animation plays this frame. For example, here I have a prefab where a simple particle effect is played. We look for a good timestamp where it makes sense to play this effect and use the instruction instantiate. And choose the right hand of the character as the starting location. This animation clip is always executed on the character object referenced by the actor and the clip will be stopped if the line is finished before the animation is complete. Let's see this feature in action. Right above the sequencing tool, you can configure the animation's properties, such as the amount of blending, speed, and root motion values. The on start and on end instructions from below, as their name implies, allow running instructions right before the text line is delivered and right after finishing it. The duration field lets you specify how long the text takes to skip to the next line. By default, it's set to until interaction, which puts the text on hold indefinitely 
until the user clicks or interacts with the dialog. This value can be changed to automatically jump to the next line after the animation ends, after the voiceover line finishes, or after a certain amount of time has passed. The jump field is set to continue by default, which means that the next dialogue line delivered is the next child or sibling, following a natural order. You can also change this behavior so that the dialogue ends after delivering this line, or change it to jump to an arbitrary line. This last case is especially useful when making looped choices. Before choosing which line to jump to, you'll need to tag it. Tags are unique names given to lines that identify them. For example, let's say we want to jump to this line from here. We can right-click onto the line and select Tag and give it a short name that makes sense. After doing so, we'll be able to choose this tag from the drop-down menu. Now that we know how a text node works, let's go over some useful tips. We know that dialog lines are delivered from top to bottom, so if we create these three text lines, they will be executed in their natural order. However, we can drag and drop the second one onto the first node in order to make it a child of the first. If we are to execute this dialog, the order in which the lines are delivered won't change. That's because before running the next sibling line, it first tries to execute any children lines that it has. So wait, what's the advantage of setting child lines if the order doesn't change? We saw earlier that we can add conditions to text nodes, which determines whether they are executed or not. If a node is not executed due to the negative result of the conditions, its child nodes won't be executed either. This can be used to visually separate blocks of dialogues and regions. The next node type is the random pick. This node randomly picks a node, excluding those that have conditions that return a false value after checking them. To create a random node, click the dice icon on the toolbar, or change the type of any existing node to random. When doing so, you'll see there's a checkbox field below called Allow Repeat. Unticking this checkbox will make sure that the same node can't be selected two times in a row. The random node is particularly useful when you want characters to shout random barks at the player. For example, a merchant welcoming the player to his shop. The last dialog node type is no other than the choice. This node allows the user to pick a text node from its child nodes. This type of node has quite a few configuration options. If the Hide Unavailable field is ticked, any choice options whose conditions return false will be hidden from the user. Otherwise, the option is displayed but grayed out, so it's not interactive. This is useful if you don't want to give away the option, if the condition depends on a narration twist. On the other hand, having a grayed out option can be very useful if you're doing skill-based choices and the player doesn't have the necessary level. The Skip Choice checkbox determines whether or not the chosen node is executed. This can be used when you have a silent protagonist and the chosen option is assumed to be delivered. Ticking Shuffle Choices will randomize the order in which the choices are presented. The Timed Choice field allows you to define whether or not the player has a fixed amount of time to make a choice. If this field is ticked, two new fields appear below. The first one allows you to choose the duration in seconds that the player will have for the timeout. And the second one defines the behavior if the player fails to pick an option in the defined time window. By default, it chooses a random option. However, this can be changed to pick the first or the last option in the list. That's it! Now that you know how the dialogue module works, we recommend checking out the built-in examples to see how to create common mechanics like skill checks, looped choices, barks, and much more. Get the dialogue module for Game Creator on the Unity Asset Store. Happy game making!